Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God. And tonight, I want to talk about one of the mysteries that God revealed to my husband um, when he was in prayer. And so I'm going to steal it from him. But we are one flesh, so I guess it's not stealing, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> and I'm actually going to preach on a mystery that he received in a vision from the Lord. Now, the vision is in this shirtless in my offering, so I'm not going to tell you all about his vision because it's going to be like, I wouldn't want to preach the same thing he's preaching. But I have to tell you that in the middle of listening to him teach on this, I got a tool that has revolutionized my <laughs> daily prayer life. And so I'm just going to give it to you and hope that it helps you guys with your prayer lives. Okay. I'm going to title this Praying from power. And I submit to you that a lot of our prayers are powerless. And I'm going to tell you why. See, in, when my husband was in this vision with the Lord, the Lord told him, there are three seats of motivation in a man's heart. Love, fear, and selfish ambition. And when he went before the Lord in this vision, he kept, I think there was a, a pail and a broom. And he would walk in before the Lord into the throne room, and the Lord would say, you can't bring those. And he's like, ah, I thought I dropped them. I thought, yeah, what are they doing in my hands again? Um, and the sense of it was, the Lord says, when you come before me in these places, you can't come with fear, and you can't come with selfish ambition. And I submit to you that a ton of our prayer life is on the seat of fear. It, it has been for me, and I'm not a fearful person. I would argue with you, if you said, Donna, you're a fearful person, I would have said, no way. I grew up in martial arts, I'll kick your butt. <laughs> I've had deliverance for that, okay. <laughs> but I would say that a huge portion of my prayer life has been motivated from fear. How many parents are out here? Okay, let's talk about those prayers. Oh God, oh God, please, please let my kids actually grow up. <laughs> oh, and... And yes, please let them marry the right person. Not that one, not that one, no, not that one. Over here, okay, move, okay, oh, Jesus, Jesus, please help. Okay, come on, you're with me. I think a lot of our prayers come on the seat of fear. And those are not the prayers that Jesus puts his amen to. They are powerless prayers. And matter of fact, when you pray them, you're actually stirring up an atmosphere around yourself of fear that hopefully by the time you get through praying, God has gotten through all of that to you, and you're calm at least. But you've just left him with this pile of fear to bless. And he doesn't bless fear. It's against his nature to bless fear. So what do you do? You get on that seat of love. And I tell you, I, I don't know how many of you are like me, but I, I'm very goal-oriented. And I love being able to check off my boxes. Did this, did that, did this. And this has been so helpful for me because when I go before the Lord now in prayer and I want to lift something up, I pay attention to where my bottom is sitting. And I see three chairs. And it is so funny because I'll start praying and I'll realize, oh, shoot, I'm in the wrong chair. Okay, okay, move over, move over, okay. But you know what's kind of funny is as I'm learning this, I've prayed a lot less. 
You know, that's not good news. I've prayed less because most of my prayers were motivated out of fear or selfish ambition. I've had a whole lot less to pray about. There's a thought right there. So what does that look like, selfish ambition over here? Oh, I just, you know, I want, I want our team to win. I want our team to be amazing. I want our team to do so good. And now I'm competitive, so this is a good prayer. I like these prayers. Okay. And you can do that on the love seat. You can. You can't do that one. Because God, we want to we wanna just be the best in all that we can do, all that stuff. Okay, but when it moves over here too, we want to just cream them. We want to be amazing. Then you kind of went over into, because we want to look good. And you're into selfish ambition. Now, you see I'm being kind of funny. But there's all times that we're in these seats. I was in a, <laughs> a sozo, and I was the second, which was kind of funny. And we're praying with a woman who um, actually is um, really good at manipulating the spirit realm. Let's put it that way. This woman um, is not only broken, but she uses the demonic to control. Okay? You with me? Okay. So I'm sitting as the second. And okay, we've got the seats. We've got fear. We've got love. And we've got selfish ambition, right? Okay, so here's the thing. I'll put them a little closer together so I don't have to move so far. Okay. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting on the seat, and the spirit realm is just flying around, and I'm getting sick to my stomach. And, you know, it doesn't happen like this usually. Don't panic in Sozos. But um, this woman is just using the spirit realm, and, and I'm spinning, and I'm thinking, I'm going to try. I'm going to throw up, you know, which, which we don't do. Okay. And I'm getting this massive headache. <laughs> And I'm realizing I'm over here. Oh, this lady's nuts. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what are we going to do? And I'm like, okay, okay, over love, 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 love. Jesus loves me, this I know. Okay, all right, okay, all right, all right, all right. It's not her fault that she uses the spirit realm. It's a defense mechanism. It's okay. God, release her. Help her not to be afraid. And wow, God, when she gets healed, this is going to be a great testimony. Oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Back over here. And I tell you something. I was flipping in and out of that seat so fast, I didn't know who I was or where I was sitting. And I was, boom, 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 boom. and finally I'm like, oh. and I, I, and my, my husband has a phrase. It's like he just grab, picks himself up, his soul. He just, he has a spirit man pick his soul up and goes, you know. And I just felt my spirit man go, stop it. <laughs> and he just picked me up and set me on that seat of love. And I'm like, you can do this, Jesus. And poof breakthrough happened. Absolutely bizarre showing of how those seats worked. And it wasn't until I was parked on the seat of love that breakthrough came through. And later I had to tell the prayer servant, I said, I'm so sorry, I was probably tripping you out, wasn't I? Because I was flipping all over the place. She goes, yeah, I'm used to it. I'm like, i got to talk to our seconds then because we got to quit having us moving around those seats. It is absolutely strange to see, but the power of God when we stay in love. It, nothing can stand against it. And God blesses the prayer when we're on the seat of love. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. You know, I like, you know, Pastor Bill tells us that Jesus is the ultimate example. And so I just want to look at some of Jesus' moments. And I hope it doesn't seem irreverent the way I'm going to present these things. So um, hopefully there's some good fun grace in what I'm doing here. But I'm going to talk about a couple of Jesus' things, and then I'm going to see about what if he was in a different seat. Okay? So we're going to do some role-playing. Okay? All right, here we go. Matthew 14, 13. 
Now, when Jesus, he's, he's got, John the Baptist has just been beheaded, okay? So now when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a secluded place by himself. And when the people heard of it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when he went ashore, he saw the crowd, the large crowd, felt compassion for them and healed the sick. John the Baptist was just beheaded and Jesus knows his time is coming. And he withdrew, not because of fear, but probably because out of a sense of, oh, I've lost a good person here. Not lost, lost, but ah, oh, the grief of someone that I loved was taken. Okay? So a crowd comes. And he can instantly be in this place of, oh no, they're coming for me now. And would he have healed the sick? I don't think so. Because he would have been concerned with him and not having compassion on the crowd. You know, Jesus was God. Wow. I think the enemy tried to bait him a lot on this seat. Yeah. He did, a, you know, throw yourself down. You know, he says, I'll give you a kingdom. And Jesus is like, I'm not sitting on that seat. I am not sitting on that seat of selfish ambition because I'm come to do the will of my Father and I'm going to stay where he set me. What about in the garden? In Matthew 26, 36 through 39. Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. See, we think that this grieving is over here. But do you realize you can actually grieve in love? You know, that is really misunderstood. When something bad happens to you, you have the right to grieve. You don't have to smile and pretend it's all okay. You just can't get off of the love and onto the fear of it'll always be bad. It'll never be good. That's where our error comes. But he was, his soul was grieved because he knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to have to follow through. He knew it was going to hurt. He knew it wasn't going to be fun. But you know what I think? I think what grieved him is he was going to have to leave his buddies behind for a while. And they were going to have to learn to walk without him. And I think that's what grieved him more. He took with him Peter to the son Zebedee, began to be grieved and distressed. He said, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. He went a little beyond them and fell on his faith. He said, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not I want, but as you will. History would have been a whole lot different if he'd been sitting on this seat over here. I'm not going to do it. I don't care that you're God and I'm your son. I'm not going to do it. I don't want to go through this. There's got to be a different way to do this. And, you know, we're going to figure that out. Or, you know what? You know, I'm just going to show everybody that I'm God. And, you know, we'll just, we'll just skip all this other stuff. And I'm just going to show them how it works. But he submitted to the plan of love. And hopefully that's not irreverent the way I was showing it for you guys. But it helps me to see um, that those places of motivation are what keeps me able to go before the Lord boldly and with a prayer of power. See, I thought I was powerful before 
because I was very loud. God, you just, you really know, you really have got to do this. I mean, you just don't understand. It's going to be this, it's going to be that. And this volume made me feel powerful. And I did always walk away way more peaceful because the God of peace would always come. But I didn't realize the lack of power from being on the seat of fear. And my prayers were continual. I had to keep going back for those prayers. Why? Because he can't bless the prayers on the seat. Over here, um, you know, let's say I've written a book, which I haven't written a book, and let's say no one is buying my book, which I'm not prophesying when I do write one, they won't. Um, and I'm like, God, you know, you just got to show everybody that I'm awesome, that I'm just like this powerful woman, and they're going to buy this book. And, and God, you can't bless that prayer either. Where is your prayer life? What seat are you on? You know, <laughs> I tore something in my knee. Not a big deal, but it hurts. I've torn it before. I've had surgeries before on it. Um, so I know it's not going to be terrible, but it hurts way worse this time around than when I did it before. And um, I've been in a lot of pain. Honestly, I've been in a heck of a lot of pain. So bad that I can't think sometimes. And it's just my knee. It's not all of me that hurts. You know? And so um, I've been really doing better at praying for people who are in pain. Because I think, wow, I hurt and it's just my knee. And people have hurt all over, all the time. You know, so so I've, it's kind of motivated me to get more on that seat of love in a broader fashion for people. Okay, all right. So I have been through, and we went to the UK. Um, I hobbled around the UK, um, had a week home, went to Germany, Switzerland. It really got bad. I've had so much prayer. I've had the anointing. I've had, oh, heat and cold and all kinds of fun stuff. And it works for about 10 minutes, and then it lifts, and I'm in pain again. Now, I'm still going to pray for my knee. But there's a pull on where to pray. And the pull is, God, I don't want to have surgery again. And you know what, God? I don't want to be the pastor that's having surgery in a church that people get healed at. <laughs> Most of you probably don't know, I wear, I wear glasses. But I won't wear glasses when I preach. Because... Some people will look at that and say, you, you haven't been healed. Why should I listen to you? Now, I don't believe that, but some people do. So I wear contacts, so you can't tell. <laughs> Except for now, you just know, yeah. And there's that sense, I mean, honestly, I don't want to have surgery. And I, I honestly, I'm embarrassed that I have to have surgery. Honestly, I am. But that prayer cannot be released because it's a seat of selfish ambition. Okay? So I have to stay here. God, this hurts. God, it, I can't think sometimes. Um, my intern, it was so cute. I had to be off my pain meds for two weeks prior to surgery. I couldn't think. I hurt so bad. But then they postponed my surgery because I'm going to Scotland and they don't want me on a plane. So I had to postpone my surgery. You know, um, and so I got to go back on some pain meds. And my intern walks in and she says, hey, you're back on your meds, aren't you? <laughs> I'm like, I hadn't said a word. And I'm like, yeah, is that obvious, huh? Yeah, okay. Um, and, you know, God... Every time you have surgery, something can go wrong. I mean, this is a minor surgery. It's just a torn meniscus, some arthritis, to scrape off, whatever. Okay, God. But there's, there's that, I don't want to do this because, God, I don't want my knee messed up. I love to run. And my husband, I'm, Steve made me very mad the other day. Because I'm like, I love to run. I'm born to run. And I come home, he goes, yeah, you were born to run, huh? 
I'm like, I'm going to come back and talk to you later. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I was born to run. And I might not get to run. God, you've got to heal me so I can run. But he doesn't bless that prayer. Thank you, God, that you're a God that heals. And I choose to be unoffended that you're not healing me right now. And I choose to believe that any minute you could heal me. Do you know the first thought that went through my mind, the second thought that went through my mind when they postponed my surgery? My first thought was, oh, blank. That's my first thought. <laughs> and my second thought was, wow, that gives God two more weeks to heal me. And I felt like the Lord said, I don't need two more weeks to heal you. <laughs> Good point. Went to the healing rooms. Went through all the prayer. Did Nothing happened. It's okay. I'm refusing to be offended at my God. But that's the other sermon. Okay. So, back to Germany. I'm in Germany. I'm sitting on a stool because I hurt so bad. I mean, and they're trying to get ice in Europe is like having a baby. It's crazy. Um, so you're trying to get ice packs on, and they don't freeze. And then you get, we, we went to one place. They didn't have ice. I mean, the place we stayed was like, no, we don't have any ice. Okay. All right. Um, and so you're, my leg's just more and more swollen. Okay. And... This lady comes in on crutches. Okay, she's paler than pale. And I look at her in the midst of my pain, in the midst of, I've had 70 people pray for me, and I'm not yet seeing the manifestation of the healing. Okay? That's, that's the nice way of saying, we we're not healed yet. Okay. All right. And she comes in in so much pain. And I have an opportunity to pray, okay? And instantly, I had this compassion, and I thought, she hurts worse than I do. I mean, she is pale, and she's struggling to walk in, and she's on crutches, and all this stuff's going on, and I walk over to her, and I tell you, I had no faith. And I just walked over to her, I said, what is going on? She goes, I fell and I cracked my kneecap. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. Jesus, would you just come and heal her? Would you? No, I don't. I don't think he's going to do it. Um, sorry. You guys ever been there? I'm probably the only one here that doesn't have faith at times. But, but, I was on the seat of love. It's like. God, she hurts so much worse than I do. And I'm not giving her my healing. I'm not doing that one. You know, it's not about she gets it instead of me because that's not God either. Okay. But God, you know what? She knows I'm limping. Everyone knows I'm limping. I mean, I'm surprised she's letting me even pray for her. Right. But God, just, just, would you just come and would you just release healing over her body? Just, I speak to that knee and I say, be healed in Jesus name. And then I just walked off. Okay. Her husband comes back within two, three minutes with the crutches. Yeah. Says, you are not going to believe this. I said, I'm probably not going to believe this. Because my wife is healed. And she was going in for her sozo. She got her sozo. Um, a couple weeks later, we get an email. She went back to the doctor. And there's no evidence she ever cracked her knee. Okay, knee. Come on. But what happened was I prayed from the right seat. And even though I didn't have this great faith, even though I didn't, you know, the seat of fear would have been, oh, you're not going to heal her, so I'm not going to pray. Okay, well, I have to pray. All right, God, would you do it? No, I didn't have that heart. 
I'll, I'd be lying if I told you that I had great faith, but I definitely had love and compassion. I'm like, oh, baby, I am so sorry you hurt. And healed. Absolutely bizarre what God does when you're in the right seat. Now, you did not hear me say that every time your prayers are not answered the way you want, you're on the wrong seat. You did not hear me say that. You might think you did, but you did not. Because I have prayed with great compassion for some people, and they have not gotten well. So don't make this bigger than it is. Take it for what it's worth and figure out what seat you're sitting on when you begin to pray. And don't be discouraged that you'll be praying a lot less for a while. Because you'll start to pray and you'll find yourself probably 75% of the time on, in the fear seat. And you'll have to stop yourself and you won't know how to get to the other seat yet. And just stop. And just listen. And let God teach you how to move to the seat of love. The other 15% of my time is selfish ambition. And you know, um, it, that's really ugly to say as a Christian, but we like to be amazing. We like people to know who we are. I love it when um, I find out that someone bought something that I did and it helped them. I love that. Um, and, and I think some of my prayers are over here. And a lot less than fear, I have found, but still there. And I have to stop those and, and get off that seat. Our son, our oldest son, is doing his second CD. It's almost done. It, it rocks. It's so awesome. Um, it's going to be really fun. And I was listening to his CD, um, which I'm not supposed to be because it's not ready yet. But I was listening to pieces of the CD. And um, I started feeling anxious. And I, I don't know, I wasn't praying, I, I was just laying there and I'm feeling anxious and I'm thinking, ooh, okay, I don't want his CD to release that, so is there something wrong that I need to tell him about spiritually? And then it was like, the Lord's like, no, that's you, because you're over here on this seat. And it was, I wasn't sure which one I was on, but I think I was on the selfish ambition one, a little bit of fear, maybe I had them two together. Because I'm thinking, what if no one buys it? And, and God, that's the fear, but, but God, you know, he's got such a gift for writing. This kid writes voraciously. His, his lyrics are like poetry, which he's a poet. And, and he's got, he put on Facebook that he was listening to his album, and he thought, man, that girl has a beautiful voice. And then he said, oh, that's me. <laughs> it's not a girl. <laughs> so he's got these ranges. It's just, oh, it's so awesome. And what if, what if he's never found? What if they never find him? What if he just grows up to, to just be normal like the rest of us? <laughs> Do you see the anxiousness was me? I wasn't even praying yet. But it was where I was going to go had I started the prayer. And I, I had to get myself up and think, okay, wait a minute, Lord. Oh, this is not what he's releasing. It's what I'm releasing because I'm wanting him to be famous. Not because I care, but because I want him to get his dream. Right? So, Lord, I thank you. This is for all our children. That you put a call on their lives. And that our children will fulfill the call on their lives. And what is so cool about our destinies, and I've taught this before, I am so into specific destinies. You're going to do this, and you're going to do that, and set the captives free, and you're going to be a business person, and you're going to do music, and all of this stuff. But the first and foremost destiny for each of us is to conform to the image of Christ. And my sons, both of them, are, I have had to learn in each of the things they've gone through how to conform to the image of Christ. And that is way more important to God than whether he's famous. And it should be way more important to you, to me, okay? So, this is what we're going to do. 
I'm going to have you close your eyes for a second. And I'm going to have you think about the one prayer that has been the heaviest on your heart, the one that you've been spending a lot of time with, the one that um, your energy has gone to. And I want you to picture the three seats. You don't have to actually see them, but just kind of put it in your mind. Oh, you know, there's, there's three seats. That's an interesting thought. And I want you to ask this. So repeat after me. Holy Spirit, when I pray for this issue, which seat am I usually in? If you heard fear, stand up. And we're going to pray. So repeat after me. Jesus, Jesus I, repent. I repent. I have misunderstood prayer. <sighs> I have bought into the lie that I bring all my stuff to you, all stirred up, and just throw it at you and expect you to bless it. And I repent. And I ask you to forgive me for every prayer I've prayed from fear. Oh, ha! And I thank you for grace. And I thank you for mercy. And I thank you that you have blessed those prayers sometimes even when I was on the wrong seat. Because you are a God of love. Today, I hand to you fear. And I'm not going to partner with it anymore. And I give you permission, Holy Spirit, to move to, I'm just going to be kind of funny, but like to bounce me off the seat of fear <laughs> into the seat of love. Every time I start to sit in that seat of fear. Fear, you are not my friend. And it is a lie that you help me. Ha! I'm going to pray just fine without you. And I'm probably going to see a lot more evidence of my prayers. Father God, what do you want me to know? You might want to write down what he tells you. It's a key. It's one of those secrets of the mysteries. Okay, go ahead and have a seat. When we prayed, which seat you were on, how many of you heard selfish ambition? If you did, stand up. Because we're going to pray through that one. There's no shame in this. I mean, I'm telling you all my stuff. Come on. All right. So here you go. Same type of prayer. Repeat after me. Jesus, I repent for any time I have set on that seat of selfish ambition. Where it has skewed my vision to jealousy and envy, to competition, and it has stolen my joy in even the testimonies of others. So today, I forsake that seat of selfish ambition. And I move to the seat of love. 
and I break the power of ambition, and I begin to change my thoughts where I can rejoice in other people's testimonies. Because I'm now sitting on the seat of love. And that testimony now won't taunt me. But my prayer will be, do it again, God. And I invite you, Jesus. Actually, I think it's Father God. So I invite you, Father God, to hold me tight on that seat of love until it becomes my nature. Whoa. Ha. Ha. Father God, what do you want me to know? And write it down when you hear it. Ha. Okay, go ahead and have a seat. How are we doing? Um, I think that's pretty clear. I think we've hashed that quite a bit. We will have prayer a little bit later. But one of the things that I, I really feel called to do is, you know, I, I've said this a bunch of times, but I feel like I can't not say it again. We can't go after it again. You know, we're going to go for this again. Is um, Eric Johnson had asked our team, you know, what God was doing this year. And I, I felt like the Lord said mental illness was going to bow. Yeah, and... Uh, I feel like, you know, we're getting towards further into the, the um, year, you know, and I hear on, on this side, I go before the Lord, God, my name's out there. I told you I was going to bow. And you, I mean, ah, okay, that's, he's not hearing that prayer. Um, God, come on, you got to do this. Not hearing that prayer. You know, God, the, we need to be healed. We need mental illness to bow. And I thank you that you gave a word, confirmed it in so many different ways, because Eric heard the same thing, that mental illness was going to bow. That mental things, physical issues with the brain are going to bow. We've had some great testimonies where people have been healed since then. And so I just want to encourage you, if there's anyone in here who's dealing with torment in the mind, or you have a physical um, injury to the brain, or you have, a, like your thoughts aren't working like they used to, I want you to stand up and we're just going to pray for you. Ha! <clears throat> so I want you guys to, to get around them, lay hands on them. We, ch this is church, we know how to do this. So, Papa, we just declare right now, we, we agree on that seat of love that you have released an anointing for the church to break mental illness, Whoa. Ah. to break the torments of the mind, ah. to restore any physical damage that's been done. And Papa, we break off witchcraft. We will break off any curses that have gone on. We declare into the mind that it doesn't matter your age. Yes, you can think. Yes, your neurons will fire up. We, we break off any disconnects in pathways. We, we um, add um, any um, guardrails that need to be put on the brain. We, we just release those. That, Papa, you would reconfigure physically, spiritually, and mentally anything going on. And I say to the voices that harass you to shut up in Jesus' name. Ha! <laughs> Papa, I break off the lie that I'm hearing that it won't work because my whole family has this. And I just say, that's not too hard for God. And we just, whoa, I thank you, Jesus, that when you died on the cross, you didn't just die for one person. You died for all of us. And so I break off the lie that because everyone in the family has it, it's just my genetic makeup. And I thank you, Jesus, that you get to change even our DNA. And we declare that all things are possible with our God. Ha! <sighs> 
Whoa, Papa, I release hope right now. Oh, ha. To each person. I declare it to people that are watching the screens. I don't care when you see this. When you see it, it'll be the time that you need the prayer. And we just declare that oh, in your holy name. And we thank you for that, Papa. Whoa. For anyone who stood up, I want you to just do this. I want you to say, Jesus, I hand to you hopelessness. And I hand to you the fear that this will never change. And I release you, Jesus. It's probably not the right way to say it, but that, ah, oh well. <laughs> to go past my unbelief to go past hopelessness and shock me with your love. <sighs> Thank you, Papa. Amen. <laughs>